Hello, my dear friends. Today, we will read the remarkable story of a Russian officer of the Imperial Army who served as an interpreter at the 206th Wehrmacht Division headquarters on the Eastern Front. His military experience was great. He fought in naval battles with Turkish vessels at the Bosphorus during the First World War. He was honored with many awards of the Imperial Army, including the Order of St. Anne for bravery. Ivan Kamensky, as well as tens of thousands of Russian officers, fled Russia after the lost civil war against the Bolsheviks. In 1920, along with the Russian Navy, he evacuated from the Crimea to Bizerte. Upon his discharge, he lived in France, working as a cab driver and editing the monthly Russian military periodical Army and Navy, which was published in Paris. During World War II, he voluntarily became a military interpreter in the Wehrmacht, serving at the headquarters of the 206th Division on the Eastern Front. His diary represents an undoubted object of interest both from a historical and psychological point of view. This video is sponsored by a free online game, World of Warships. World of Warships is not just a game, it's a floating digital museum displaying breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. These ships have been given new life in the game's virtual dockyards. New content is released every month, whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. You can always count on enjoying fresh gameplay experiences in World of Warships' stunning 12v12 arenas. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Believe me, 15 battles are not enough to enjoy the amazing graphics of the game. Dynamic weather effects and historically genuine ships from 10 countries will immerse you in the atmosphere of incredible naval battles. Experience new emotions with World of Warships. Well, and now let's begin. December 9, 1941. It took us more than a day to arrive at Vitebsk. It was very frosty. We loaded on a sledge. The town was ruined. The house was as bad as a barn. There's one room, some straw, but it's very warm. We are always provided with bread, butter, sausage, canned food. We have soup, coffee, tea when we stop. It is not clear what the local population lives on, but the people are healthy, red-cheeked, big as they used to be. The Red Army soldiers, on the contrary, are all as good as dead. There is nothing to give them to eat. They live in the open air, dying by numbers of thousands. Everyone who has seen them says that it is impossible to bear it. You can lose your mind. There was a worship in the church. It was almost only women. A lot of young people, children, old people. All prayed ardently, knelt on their knees. A woman's choir was singing. Their voices were good. Not bad melodies like what I heard in the Eglise Saint Serge in Paris. The entire male population is almost absent, except for old men. The church is equally poor-looking, but some good icons and towels with embroideries have been preserved. There was a moldbin to St. George the Victorious, then a memorial service. The priest is exhausted, but he serves as in Paris. Beggarly old ladies are here. I apologize to them that I have nothing but money to give. They are warmly dressed, but there are some very emaciated faces. December 12th, Urgev, 25th Corps Headquarters. I haven't been out anywhere. I have a little cold, and I'm afraid of having to face the population, their needs. I am waiting for life itself to quiet down. I am not even mentioning comfort, but it is necessary to get ready for a hard, lonely life, to witness horrible scenes of suffering, violence. It was unbearable for me to drive the machines at the factory, and to stand up at night, and it was impossible to continue my life back in Paris. My only hope was God and a miracle. The future is still very, very dark and black. I do not feel worried about my family financially. The children are partly my worry. December 21st, the village of Bolshoya Kapkovo. In the last few days there has been a snowstorm, truly as it was sung in a romance. The snow has covered you, Russia. The war conditions are very hard here. The army rations are poor, and the soldiers' only pleasure is to eat something extra and make the stove red hot, if only with logs from a neighbor's house. 
there is also cruelty along with kindness. They can take the only cow, potatoes, or even clothes, body coats, and valenki. And the way the population will survive, it is no matter. The attitude is like to flies. If they die, so it is supposed to be. In part, this is not only clear, but also fair. In fact, the Bolsheviks treated people much worse. War is a terrible thing, with all its consequences and destruction. December 28th, the village of Lukovnikovo. We are in retreat. The Bolsheviks have been attacking for several days with superior forces, with tanks and artillery. They manage to break through the front, and our division keeps pulling back, and tomorrow morning we are going to the southwest. The Germans have a large number of wounded. The Soviet aviation has attacked both our village and the withdrawing columns. The Bolsheviks have terrible losses. That's what people say, but perhaps it's for consolation? Such a terrible nightmare war is. How much worse is it in the rear than at the front? How awful are its consequences? My Germans are downhearted and unhappy. Everything is confused now, and it is not at all as easy to predict what will happen next, how and when it will all come to an end, as it was in 1939. January 6th, 1942. The Village of Yablanka. On the morning of December 29th, we, the infirmary, and other units began to pull back. The retreat, as usual, was a bit of a mess. It's frosty. Sledging was impossible. I went on foot. The whole road is a column. The Soviet planes were attacking. The Germans were not reacting in any way. They were all fleeing, hiding. At first, I see bombs being thrown, then a machine gun. There are dead and wounded. There's firing and shelling all the time. The Soviets come very strongly. The Germans suffer very heavy casualties. Everywhere we go, there is nothing but poverty and emptiness. Whatever small things the peasants still had are gone, either taken by the Reds or by the Germans. This day, our entire corps has been cut off and surrounded. There was no order, and in general, there was nothing left of the army we had seen in France. There was wonderful weather, nice stopping places, food, wine, fun, promenade, and glory. But here it is cold, hunger, narrowness, mud, poor accommodation, and straw. The enthusiasm is gone. There is no enthusiasm in those joyful and excited eyes that the newspapers show. On the way, we found out that the Bolshevist offensive had been beaten back. 7,000 prisoners have been captured and they are leaving for their old positions. Everyone is horrified about the Bolsheviks' arrival. I feel very weak. I sleep well, but I lost weight terribly this month. I am skin and bones. All I had recently in Paris and Les Mensoules seems to be an incredible happiness. I would like to come back again, although only for a moment. I am not sorry that I left, but I have deprived myself of pleasure of which I had no idea. January 11th. A German SS unit stayed here with their skull and bones, going on a wild rampage, drinking, raping women, and literally robbing all the people. They seized not only Vilenki, coats, chickens, piglets, but also broke into chests, beating, threatening, etc. Overall, the German soldiers turned out to be something different from what we expected, having been in France, and they are robbing people without remorse. This is decay, not the new Europe. January 13th. The weather is very cold, for three days now. There is not much snow, but all the trees are covered with so much frost that the landscape is completely white. The sunrise and sunset are very beautiful. The red sun rises from behind the horizon, as in an operetta, and then disappears behind the horizon. Recently, a wounded soldier was brought to us, and he died. He tried to seize a cow from a peasant in Udom by force, but the peasant hit him with something heavy. It is not clear exactly how it all happened. My Germans say that all the peasants were executed as punishment. My God, save and protect all those I love. Save and protect Russia and all Russians. God, save Russia. Save the world. Let there be an end to war, turmoil, and devastation as soon as possible. January 17th, the village of Sazanovo. It is a good day, sunshine. It is not cold. All our men went farther away. I remained with the wounded. The village is awfully poor. The huts are empty, broken down, dirty, and there are lots of children. 
The wounded are in terrible conditions, in mud, in tight spaces, in stench, on straw. But when I see the suffering of the Germans, it is not painful. On the contrary, I feel some consolation that not only Russians suffer. February 6th, the village of Trushkovo. God only knows what the people are experiencing. They probably eat only frozen potatoes, but the Germans refuse to understand this, and they are very unjust and cruel. February 10th. When I look at the people, I see that the youth are bold, brave, they never at a loss for words, and they have no hatred for the Soviets whatsoever. Of course, I only see peasants. They curse the Kolkhozes, but haven't they used to curse their life under the Tsar? Accusing the landowners about everything? Now it is obvious that there could not have been an uprising with such a mood of the peasants. I believe we had a wrong picture of life in the Soviet Union. Life was not bad for everyone, but of course it was extremely strict and they made everyone work extremely hard. They replaced a rational system of production with this. Therefore, they created vehicles in the army after all. The Bolsheviks kept attacking and, of course, suffered heavy losses. March 2nd, the village of Bertsevo. The news at the front is bad. To our west, the Bolsheviks have taken Mostovaya, a station on the urzhev neladovo Railroad, which is a long way south of us, so we stand way behind, and we can hardly hold on here. We had a discussion about it. My people were down in the dumps, but they have no doubts about victory, but see that it would be very difficult and very long. Obviously, there is a lack of troops and equipment. It is not understandable where the German aviation, tanks, artillery have gone. The Bolsheviks have an advantage in all this, and although they suffer losses, the Germans suffer very heavy losses too. Defending the front. Knowing the truth now, I see how false and unfair the content of the newspapers and correspondence coming from the front is. It's all about sugar and idealization, which in fact I have never met. March 17th. It is very heavy conditions at the front. There are regular incidents of self-mutilation. The soldiers throw machine guns and ammunition into the snow and do not move forward. And such occurrences are not unique. The Bolsheviks are still attacking and our situation is not good. The soldiers are utterly exhausted. It is noticeable according to the wounded. They are totally demoralized. March 30th. I feel very badly about everything. I cannot protect the people. I see that they are being deprived of everything, and I cannot stop the soldiers' willfulness. And generally, it is very painful for me to witness this new, unknown-to-me appearance of the German soldier, with no human feeling, that, having more than necessary for living, takes away everything that belongs to women and children. It makes me overwhelmed, angered, insulted, and I can do nothing and must serve them. I am astonished at our Germans with their ignorance and lack of imagination. They have not heard anything about Russia or Bolshevism, asking, who was Pushkin, a communist? April 7th. Dr. Schopfer is remarkably insensitive and shameless, yet a very nice man. But he's typical German. He comes to us when everybody's at the table. You cannot, then, not offer him a bowl of soup. He does not refuse and calmly eats three bowls and we have finished long ago and are waiting for permission to smoke. I couldn't even swallow a little bit, but he, as if intentionally, takes his time, puts the food aside, and keeps talking. He doesn't understand that he's disturbing everyone. Many men and women ask me a lot about everything. They are used to it and pay attention to me, but they do not understand my hatred of the Bolsheviks, because they have nothing to compare their life of forced labor with. They refuse to believe that in Germany the peasants do not hand over their bread to the authorities. This is the most important point they are interested in, whether they hand over bread to the authorities there. They do not believe that you can keep all the bread for yourself and dispose of it in any way you like. April 10th. There are some soldiers sick with typhus, and there is much anxiety on this occasion. The Germans have neither patience nor understanding of nature and circumstances. They want to have roads here like in Germany. A veterinarian was there. He examined the horses. Our division lost 1,100 horses out of 6,000 in March only. It is very bad at the front. 
The infantry stands day and night in the open field. Everyone is wet. We lack non-commissioned officers. New soldiers need to be pushed forward. No enthusiasm. What a misrepresentation of everything by propaganda, and how damaging to the state of the country is the absence of a free voice. After all, just like in the Soviets, everything is in the hands of the party. All is said and written by command. Everything is glorified to the heavens, when the reality is not like that at all. The winter campaign is described as a dire disaster. The soldiers ended up without positions, without clothing, and without proper equipment in 40-degree frost. April 18th It has been two months since we arrived here. It is a nice hot day again today. The snow melts in front of our eyes, and there is not much left. A little longer and it will start to dry out. I sat and even slept on a bench in the yard this afternoon. I immediately fell into sad thoughts. I realized where I am and what I am. Leaving alone all the appalling history and devastation from the war, which is not over yet, it is frightening to think about the future of Russia. Ukraine is cut off up to the Don, the Finns in the north, the Romanians in the south. There is not a word about the Russian government, about the Russians, about Russian interests. A mistake is political due to lack of knowledge of Russia, and above all due to arrogance, unchristian, inhuman attitude to another person if he is not a German. June 22nd. It is shocking how the Germans cause dislike for themselves everywhere. Not only because they are the victors, of course, but because their attitude towards others is somewhat obnoxious. I remember the phrase of Dostoevsky, that all nations are smug, but the Germans are the most unpleasant because of their stupid smugness. September 13th. The village of Cucino. The Germans fight the war in comfort, with sticky paper and curtains against flies, and their entire tactic is built on a huge technical superiority. So it was in 1914 to 1918, and so it is now. We hit them with a club, and they hit us with a machine gun. They keep their soldiers safe, feed them well, clothe them well, they live in good conditions. They go on leave, receive and send letters and parcels. They do not strain themselves with work. On the contrary, everyone lives here like on summer vacation. And they advance only if they have a great technical superiority and can literally crush the enemy without any loss of life. April 16, 1944. Vitebsk, the airfield. I managed to make it to Easter. Went to Matens and Mass and did not have the gladness I expected. On the way, I met groups of young women in white kerchiefs and even large groups of people going to church. It was all people coming from the labor camps. When we arrived, the church was so crowded that there was no room to swing a cat in. I struggled to move forward to the choir. My seat was taken. I was not pleased with this crowd. It was much better to be in a half-empty church. The German soldiers, who had brought people from the works battalions and also came into the church, also grinded my gears. When I saw the German soldiers in the altar, I pushed them all out into the gatehouse where the soldiers were also sitting and standing. I explained to them the obscene nature of their behavior, and they, idiots, replied that there was no room in the church. In other words, what an insensitive and rude bunch of people! And still, they pretend to be culture raisers. What a bunch of true lansknecks! I told them that this was the altar. They might be outside or in the gatehouse, but not inside the altar. A soldier in a cap was at the entrance to the church, and I ordered him to take it off, and he did so with displeasure. Their lack of tact knows no bounds. It has a nasty effect on me, and all my glad anticipation has vanished because of these little details. Or can it be that these minor things altogether were brutal blows to my national orthodox sense? Were they a reminder of the gross humiliation and abyss into which Russia had fallen? Not long afterward, also in 1944, he shot himself. His diary, which he wrote in Russian, was handed over to his family, who were in Paris. I suppose his reasons are clear. Well, let me remind you that if you want to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of amazing naval battles, then play World of Warships. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards, including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, 
and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Happy hunting, Captain!